Now, so I'm going to actually skip, uh, stay, rather than go to the slide, I'm going to, let's, I'll walk you through the logic. So take a, take a situation first where there is diminishing returns in production, concave production function. Assuming, uh, or we, we are at concave function, so. No, I, I'm going to assume now, I'm free to assume what I want. I'm going to assume for the time being that we're going to start with a concave function, then I'm going to move to a convex function, I'm going to take a linear function, do everything, every possible case. Let's start with a linear function. With a linear function, who will be credit constrained? The poor or the rich? Low wealth or high wealth? Everybody's identical in every other way. <laughs> Sorry? Mm, well, okay, let's walk through that. Okay, it's a linear production function. Linear production function means everybody's marginal product is the same. Given that if, so that means that to say that I'm credit constraint is to say that my marginal product is higher than the interest rate. Otherwise, I'm not credit constrained, right? But if my marginal product is higher than that, and everybody has the same marginal product, then everybody must be credit constrained. So to, for the capital market to clear, the interest rate must go up, and nobody will be credit constrained. In, in a, with a linear production function, nobody will be credit constrained, because we'll all bid for the capital, even the, you know, in, in equilibrium, you can say everybody's credit constraint or no one's credit constraint, but everybody, nobody, the interest rate will keep rising because if I, the capital here, I have to be willing to lend to you, okay? So if I, if you want to borrow from more from me, since I have the same production function, I don't want to lend to you because my marginal product must be higher than interest rate as well. If you want to borrow more, I want to borrow more. So I won't lend to you, so the interest rate would keep rising till the market clears. Where will it clear? The marginal product has to be equal to the interest rate. There's no way to, for the market to clear. So in other words, with linear production functions, we know nobody is credit constrained. Uh, the everybody will, everybody's Euler equation will be satisfied. Everybody's consumption will grow at the same rate. Everybody's wealth will grow at the same rate. There will be no change in the steady state distribution. You know, you hit the steady state distribution instantly, and you'll stay there. Okay. Very simple. Now let's go take the next step. Let's assume, yeah? Sorry, what, what is the parameter uh, phi? Uh, it's the... Uh, CRRA parameter, the parameter on the utility function. Um, it's not theta, I think. Maybe, it, maybe it's theta. I'm so, if it is, then uh, my apologies. Uh, let's do the next one. Um, diminishing returns. <laughs> Who will be credit constrained, rich or the poor? The rich will be credit constrained or the poor? Is it rich? The poor. The poor will be ready to say, why? Somebody give me the answer. If they will have <coughs> higher marginal return. Right, exactly. So if the rich, suppose the rich are credit constrained, then the marginal product is higher than the interest rate. Since the poor have higher marginal products than the rich, they must also be credit constrained. So you cannot have an economy where everybody is credit constrained, since nobody would lend. Therefore, in equilibrium, the rich must be unconstrained and the poor must be constrained. Okay? With diminishing returns, we know exactly. So, so with diminishing returns, this equation holds for the rich and not for the poor. What does that imply for the growth rate of consumption? Whose growth rate is growing fast? Is high, whose consumption is growing faster? It's all written there. I just want, sorry? The poor consumption will have higher consumption growth because this equation says exactly that. So the poor will 
get, get relatively richer over time and will converge towards the rich, do they have to fully converge? Do they have to fully converge or not? Sorry? Mm, I mean, the thing that it's, it's not a problem because in that case, the poor and the, and the rich are optimizing. No, everybody's optimizing here, relative to the constraint. Question is, would you, would you have a steady state, can you converge to a steady state without full equality in this economy? I said the poor are growing faster than the rich. So they're going, coming closer to the rich. Do they hit them or should there be some inequality in the long run? Can there be some inequality in the long run? Less return, if you're richer, you will have less return. So at the end, you will. So the, the answer is no, they should, don't need to converge, but let me, it's maybe a bit, uh, it's a useful exercise to think about for, because it kind of gives you an idea of what, what's going on. So they don't need to converge. The reason they don't need to converge is think about what, what, what is a possible steady state. A possible steady state is one where, you know, the interest rate is some number r, r star, call it r star, okay? Now, at r star, there is a lambda of r star. Lambda is just a function of r, so lambda of r star. Okay, now take somebody who, two people, who are such that times W1 minus C1 is uh, bigger than, so sorry, let, let me do, let me do one more, put in one more piece of notation, it'll make it easier. In the steady state, let's say the average capital stock is K star. Per capita, capital stock is K star, okay? Now take somebody who's, who, who has wealth less than K star, so not full equality. But let's say that lambda times W minus whatever they consume, some number in steady state, their, uh, their, uh, their C is bigger than K star. So in other words, they can still borrow a little bit, and by borrowing, they can cover the capital stock they need to invest. Okay, so what this says, is that I borrow a certain amount, it, and by borrowing it, if I were to invest all of it, I would actually be investing more than K star. That's absolutely a situation where we're going to have, these people won't want to borrow that much because they would be borrowing to, investing too much in that case. And therefore, we would have a steady state where they, there is some inequality. The people are kind of close, to, close enough to each other that even the poorest person can invest more than the average of the economy. So some inequality is possible in steady state, but not a lot. And you know exactly how much. It depends on the lambda function. 
the lambda function is, you know, if people can borrow more, there'll be more inequality in steady state. Okay. So, if what will have to happen, so what we know is that from this equation, that in steady state, nobody's credit constraint. There's a, somebody was credit constraint, then his consumption, that's what you were saying, his consumption should be growing faster. So there would be no, no one who's going to be constrained. That's point number one. In steady state, nobody's constrained. Credit constraints go away. So this then looks just like an economy where there were no credit constraints to start with. So the steady state of this economy is there's no one who's credit constrained. They, you, you're investing the efficient amount. And maybe there's some inequality. So that's what must happen. Okay. Credit constraints undo themselves through saving. Basically, credit constraints give you an incentive. Now, let's do the other case. Increasing returns. Everybody has, you know, the marginal product keeps going up as you invest more and more. What would happen in that economy? Who, who will be credit constrained? Let's do the same uh, argument. The rich will be credit constrained. Exactly, the reverse argument. The rich will be credit constrained because if the poor were credit constrained, since the rich have a higher marginal product, they would be credit constraints. So in that economy, the poor will be lending to the rich. The rich are going to be credit constrained. Therefore, the rich will be growing faster than the poor. In fact, in that, the steady state of the economy has a Gini coefficient of one. All the wealth must be with, you know, the, the whatever, 0 0.0001 of the economy who, who have, uh, who own all the capital, and that must be the steady state. Again, once you get to the steady state, since all the wealth is owned by the people who are, or own the businesses, nobody's going to be credit constrained. You know, the extent of credit constraint being credit constrained will go to zero over time. And uh, the, you will hit a steady state where Everybody is there, but almost all the consumption is by the rich. So that's, that's the steady state of that economy. So now the, the, what becomes the complicated case. The complicated case, and this is something I, I had said once, but uh, I had mentioned some this once. So this is K, this is F of K. This is the S-shaped production function. Let me make it properly S. Okay. That's the S-shaped production function. <coughs> so what will happen in this case? Well, this is less obvious, right? Because now, there's some people who are going to be credit constrained, but we don't know who if, if they're rich or poor. You know, people up here are not going to be constrained. People down here are not going to be constrained, but in the middle, some people will be constrained. So people, people will be, so let's now, now we can, let's go down the slides a few, few slides, because it's useful to have. So, we looked at increase, constant returns, diminishing returns, increasing returns. This is, what's an S-shaped production function? Well, it's a production function where, um, for example, the one that we will work with will be of this kind. So it's, it basically says that um, you, you need to make a minimum investment so why, why do you think this is a reasonable production function? Well, it's all it's a, one version of this, which is the one that we're going to analyze, is one which looks like this. So 
So you can't get any output till you have a certain size. So it's no point having a shop with no nothing to sell. Maybe you can uh, you cannot Sorry. Uh, yes. You cannot maximize when, when you have such type of functions because it's not continuous. Uh, it's continuous. It's just not differentiable. It's complete it's continu it's continuous, so you can maximize this and that's not I mean it's not you won't get a you might get a corner, but it's differentiability is not a, doesn't create any problems. This is, it's all different. Uh, it's all continuous. So you get zero till you get to here, and then it's concave. Um, so in, in, in so take this world now. Now in the in this world, um, once again, going back to the logic we were looking at. Um, some people will be credit constrained. They're going to get richer relative to other people. Those people might be in the middle. Um, so what that does is it generates the possibility that you get divergence. So people in the middle are going to be, some people in the middle are going to going, go, growing faster than everybody else. But if you are very close to here, think of it as somebody who's here. Or let's say even here, you're close enough to be. You can invest. You can make some money, but you're going to make very little money. You're going to start your business, but you're going to make very little money in the business because at this point your average product is very low. So for these people, they may not start a business. They will have then low returns. So if you are you are not going to be constrained, you're not going to start a business. Because, and therefore, these people will then kind of pro probably converge towards the poor. So you're going to see bifurcations. Here what you'll see is that there'll be a certain threshold, and people above that threshold will say, look, I know I'm not going to make a lot of money right now, but if I make a little bit of money, I save it for five periods or 10 periods, I'll have enough money to start a big business and then I'll make a lot of money and I'm going to grow a lot richer. So you'll have to, you have to think about the whole forward looking problem, but then there'll be people who say, but I have to do it for 25 periods before I have any money. So essentially I have so little capital that maybe I can get up to here, but I'm making no money here. And then another, since I'm not making no money, it's very hard for me to save anything. So it's going to take me a very long time to get out of here. And so I'm going to be stuck there. So this, is, this goes back to your question I think, of, you know, of poverty traps. So this, this model will give you poverty traps. It will give you that there will be a bifurcation. Uh, some people are going to converge to having low consumption. Others will con converge to having high consumption. Among the people of high consumption, you might have inequality because uh, of the reasons we discussed with diminishing returns, same logic. There might be some people who are richer than others, but then there'll be a lot of people who are just stuck at basically, it's not worth it for them to save here. Because I save, but my returns are very, very low. Because I, I, you know, I, I'm, I still have to, haven't crossed this, this threshold, so I, I don't really make any money. I'm, it takes me a very long time to get to the point where I make money. Okay. So I, I, I realize I'm not doing, you know, I'm not giving you a, a huge amount of uh, detail here uh, in the sense that so the you could have multiple steady states of investment. Some people might be at a very low K1, others might be at a high K2, uh, et cetera. And you sort of, more than giving you the intuition, I can't really do very much, but let, let me say something um, more. Uh, now, so 
in the app. So what I just said is that you know you can I said two things. One is that for you can analyze this model. It's not that hard. We just did it. I mean, there's some details I skipped, but uh, not that many. And you can do it. So this model gives you. And what does it say? In the long run, it says nobody will be credit constrained. Now, that. So. So take take this world, the S-shaped world. In this world, um, in the long, e even in this world, in the long run, nobody will be credit constrained. Some people will be rich, others will be poor. Is that efficient? Exactly. So everybody here can be rich. There is nothing in this underlying production. There's no crowd out. I didn't. There is only one input. I don't. There's no demand for any other fixed factor. There's zero crowd out here. So everybody can be rich here. So the fraction of people who happen to be here is kind of pure waste. There's nothing in this economy that makes it. So in other words, while we get this property that you know, in the long run nobody is credit constrained, that doesn't mean that the equilibrium is efficient. It, it's still true that uh, you know, there are a bunch of people here, a bunch of people here. All of these people could be here. They just they never get a chance. It's never going to be optimal for them to. It takes so long for them to get out that they'll not get it. But if you started all of them over here, if you, if you gave them enough money to start with, they would all end up here. That's the nature of a poverty trap. It's the fact that everybody could be rich here, but some people are and some people are not. So that's sort of, in terms of efficiency, the, you can't really say anything in the model with, with S-shaped production functions. How about with diminishing returns? Let me just ask the question and come back to you. Is it efficient or not? If they're just diminishing returns, would we have efficiency? Yes. yes. Yes, you're right. We will have efficiency. As long as we have just diminishing returns, we would have efficiency. Because with diminishing returns, what would the social planner do? Well, he'd equalize all firms. And that's what the market does. All firms will have K star capital. So all firms will be equalized. So the, the, the equilibrium is efficient. The steady state is efficient. You might start with inefficiency because maybe some firms are too small, others are too big. Over time, they'll converge. But where they converge to is efficient. So the market generates, gives you full efficiency in the long run. You, you are basically back in the solo growth model in the lo long run, despite the fact that um, we started with credit constraints, et cetera. In the long run, we can just ignore all that. That doesn't. That property is not true. Once we move away from the uh, the diminishing returns, once we have S shape, which seems more plausible to me empirically, you will not have that. You will ha you will have the fact that the uh, even in the long run, the resource allocation is not efficient. You have no credit constraints in the long run. Everybody will have be growing at the same rate, and everybody will have nobody will be constrained. But the poor will be poor for no good reason. Is that clear, sort of the distinction I'm drawing here? That why all the models have the property, all three models have the property, that in the long run you get to efficiency. Uh, sorry, in the long run you get to no credit constraints. What some you might call 
uh, kind of local efficiency. Within a small margin, I can't change anybody's uh, wealth and increase output. Local efficiency. But globally, they're not efficient. The S with S chef, these are not globally efficient. They're locally efficient, but lo not globally efficient. Yeah. So, but how does it relate with that, with that liquid, liquid that? I mean, if there are not trade constraints in the long run, why, may, why it could be possible to have some liquid constraints? You have said that. So, it's a very good question. Let me answer it carefully. In the long run, nobody's marginal product will be different from anybody else's. That doesn't mean that they're not credit constrained if they try to borrow a lot more than they're trying to borrow. So at the margin, one more dollar is not go is give them exactly the return equal to the interest rate. But if they were to get $100,000, they would move somewhere else. That's what I mean by global, globally, they might be locally efficient, but globally inefficient. What that means is exactly that everybody, nobody's credit constraint, so if, that means everybody has the same return on a dollar. I give you a dollar, you get 25 cents from it, everybody has the same, same return. But if I were to give the poor $100,000, then they would move to a different place. It would no longer be a steady state. So there's a very uh, clear and important uh, difference between the local efficiency and the global efficiency. So people are credit constrained. We just don't see it in the data. We won't see people being credit constrained in the data. Why? Because they're all locally, it makes no difference. I can take, give you an extra dollar, your return still will be low. That doesn't mean, so when you look at the data and you find that lots of people, when you give them credit, it doesn't change anything. Well, one thought to keep in mind is that, you know, th this is local. And you indeed would go to the local, locally efficient outcome. Let me, so that's just, just conceptually, this is just to give the whole landscape. I just wanted to, I don't know how, I mean, you should read the papers, There's, the details are important, but this is sort of the landscape. Now let me say two, two things that are uh, also useful. Um, one is one thing we could do with this model, because it's so simple, is we could put in, put in, um, we could put in, you know, many different production functions Assume the standard discount factor people assume, which may well be too low, but in most macro models to fit you know, standard interest rates, you assume a discount factor of you know, 3%, 5%, 7%, not discount rate of 3, 5, 7%, not 50%. So you take standard discount factor and calibrate the model. Just simulate a model which has, has you know, assume a whole range of production functions, and ask what happens in the long run. And the answer is, in about a few years, the number we usually say is seven years, you're pretty close to efficiency. Inefficiency goes away pretty fast. The re reason is precisely this, which is that when there's a lot of inefficiency, this is very high. This gap is very high. That's a very strong incentive to save. So local inefficiency, S-shaped production functions, diminishing returns, increasing returns, local inefficiency goes away very fast. The question, so that's what the model says. The model says you're not going to see much local inefficiency in the long run. Now, I gave you, I started by showing you that there are, in fact, instances of local inefficiency, and the Shea and Klenow paper says there is lots of local inefficiency. The marginal products are not equalized. So how do these things add up? You see what the puzzle is? 
the Morrow's logic says that your people, you know, the incentive to save, which is what this gap represents, is going to be very high if the inefficiency is very high. If my marginal product is 10 times yours, then I'm going to save like mad. And therefore, I'm going to get pretty close to my efficient point pretty fast. It doesn't take very long. We sort of, our number, as I said, is seven years, and you won't have much inefficiency. So where does the inefficiency come from? And here's, a, so here's some interesting facts, which come from a different paper by Shea and Fennell. So what they do is they look at exactly this question, transitions. They look at what do, what do transitions look at? So what, does, what was the theory that I was describing saying? It was saying that essentially transitions should be pretty fast. Your incentives, if you are credit constrained, that means your rate of return on capital is very high, which means you should save a lot and grow your firm a lot. Um, so first fact is that if you, uh, you know, India is the country where we saw there was kind of maximal inefficiency. Mexico, they have, they don't have China in this paper, but they look at, uh, the, one of the striking things is that this is just the cross-sectional profile. The cross-sectional profile of firms doesn't look like the world I was describing. It looks like in India, not only is it the case that there's lots of inefficiency, but that this firm growth rate, cross-sectionally, the size of the firm is not growing very much. You know, this is just a, this is the average employment as a, a function of time. In the US, you, you explored. This is, this is in, in log scale, it's a log scale, so you know, it's just getting the biggest firms are humongously big. In India, it's very flat. So that's sort of one, one strike against our theory. Our theory said, you know, if you are constrained, if India firms are more constrained, that's why we see a lot of inefficiency, we should see the small firms growing faster in India. Um, this is using life cycle data and it looks exactly the same. So that was cross-sectional. And you might say that's cohort, there are lots of cohort effects there. Maybe the old cohorts are different from the new cohorts. Software firms enter in India somewhere here, so maybe they're different. You look at the life cycle, there were more limited sample of life cycle where they've traced firms over time, and you see the same thing. There is nothing there. You know, Indian firms are not, are just growing much more slowly than US firms. Um, this is not because, for example, uh, there's a lot of exit. Uh, in India in particular, if you like, in the US, if anything, there's tons of exit. The, this, is the, these are the, this is the exit rate, meaning people shutting down. You see, in US, what's happening is that when young firms are going out of business at a very high rate. By the time you are five years old, the chance you survive is actually pretty low. In India, if in, the exit rates are lower across the board, but if anything, the only the oldest firms exist. In the US, the oldest firms are the ones who don't exit. So it is not because, in other words, it's not, you, know, you would, if you think that uh, the reason why, uh, you know, young firms in India are not growing, it's not because they're exiting. They're staying there, just not growing. They kind of, they seem to be, they sh the whole theory says either you get out because you're not productive enough, or you stay in and grow. And we see neither. And likewise, this is number of plants, so it doesn't seem to be, so in India you see more and more new plants, so the distribution seems to be 
um, distribution seems to be moving towards younger and younger firms, but the, the, you, you still don't see much of a shift because the younger firms don't grow any more than. Um, and you know, this is just saying that employment growth is basically flat. So the US has this concave shape, convex shape, which means as you get bigger, uh, if you survive to a few years, you start growing very fast. In India, it's essentially flat or going down, if anything. Surviving doesn't make you, so it seems like you start and you stay there. And then at some point, get you, you maybe when you retire, you close your firm down 30 years later. And that you start, uh, there's no dynamism whatsoever in the, that you can pick up in the data. Productivity over uh, life cycle, the US firms have huge growth in productivity, in India it's flat, and so on. So, in my last few minutes, so why am I saying all this? I think there's some, one of the, I think, big puzzles, maybe the biggest single puzzle what this throws out is this opposition which is that the theories we have tend to be theories which say that, you know, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm small, I have an incentive to grow. Or if I'm, you know, my TFPR is high, I have an incentive to grow. And so because my, and what that says is basically if my TFPR is high, I should, you know, soon become a TFPR low firm. Basically, I should grow, I should go to the point where I'm just like any other firm. Inefficiency is self-limiting. It has it creates incentives. We don't see any evidence of that. We don't see what that, that model suggests. So now, there are, possible, there are different possible explanations. One, of course, is that you know somehow the heterogeneity is different from how we are modeling it. That there, you know, these, these are all, um, we think that they, f they have a TFPR, uh, a TFP, which is higher, but in fact, in India, the production functions all look like, uh, like that. In the US, they look like that. So the production functions are different. So what do I mean by like that? Meaning you go, there's a, exactly one place, and then there's no more growth. We are just, after all, when they are estimating things, they're estimating based on one set of production functions. They're assuming that the marginal product is proportional to the average product. Maybe that assumption is wrong. Maybe it's the case that in India, the production functions are such that there's no scope for growth. And in the US, the production functions are different. I've been imposing the same production function in both places. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe Indian firms just have different production functions. This kind of production function rather than that kind of production function. That's one possibility. It would be an interesting one to see if we can investigate. Or maybe people are, uh, people are just don't, we, we are modeling their objective functions wrong. Somehow they're not trying to do what we are thinking. Well, to, give, uh, to end, let me give you an anecdote. After all this stuff, you know, all this science, let me give you an anecdote, or almost an anecdote. We did a study in India where our, the puzzle we were trying to answer is why are the, all these people selling, well, you know, there are markets where, you know, people will sell with like, you know, sit with a bunch of goods, but you know, they're most of the time they're not selling anything. There's somebody next to them who's selling a slightly different set of goods, another person selling another set of goods, etc. They're all selling different goods, and all of them are idle for 95% of the time. We actually had them measure the time. So they're all sitting in the same market, and if you go to any developing country, this is one of the most uni uniform troops, is an underemployed uh, retailer. People are sitting there with you know, cookies, pencils, and batteries and there are thousands and thousands of people selling the same thing. So why, wh what, limits, what limits you from 
So one possibility is we, the kind of we think of as capital, but then you know how, you know you might say why don't they save a bit more? Um, so to to solve all those problems, we said okay, we'll gift you. And another might be knowledge. Maybe they don't know how to buy carrots. So we said we'll gift you carrots. Okay, we'll gift a bunch of people carrots, and see if they. What happens after we, after we take, take it away? So for two months, we gave them free carrots, two kilos of free carrots each. And we told them, we won't give you the carrots. You have to go to the to wholesale market where you buy other things. You should buy the carrots. Uh, that way you learn how to buy them. You pick, pick the carrots. So they bought the carrots. They sold the carrots. The price of carrots went down. The day we removed the subsidy, essentially, they all go back to the equilibrium where you know, the ones who used to sell carrots, sell carrots. The ones who don't sell carrots, don't sell carrots. Even though, even though they're under underemployed, they, they could sell, they make more money when they sell the carrots. The carrots are profitable. Uh, they know how to, now they know how to sell carrots. And they were making lots of money, so they could easily, based on the money that they were making, they could easily pay for the carrots. Because every day they were, we already gave them you know, free carrots for a while, so they had the capital. You know, we had the price of carrots. Just the last day, they were given the price of carrots, so they could just go buy those carrots. You buy carrots, you make lots of money. Not lots, but like relatively. And in the marginal cost of doing that is zero. They're going to the whole same wholesale market. It takes about two minutes to buy some two kilos of carrots, bring them back, sell them. People were buying them. Doesn't happen. So there's something we're missing about their objective function. I, I totally don't see what it is. I can't say, I mean, we're going to go back. We're just going back, actually, to study these carrots, other carrot sellers. But it's, it's something that I have, um, I'm completely baffled by, I must say. It's, it's, so the, the theory, in a sense, looks very abstract. But it's exactly this, which is, you know, I give you capital is pretty easy to get. Small amounts of capital are easy to get. The returns on it are very high. People are not getting it. Somewhere we're missing something. I don't know what we're missing, but I would say that if you had to think of the single biggest question in development economics is this, which is we are modeling people's objective functions wrong in some important ways. If we could get some insight into them, we'll actually, I think we'll be much more effective both in making policy and as a predictive, uh, as a predictive science. I just don't know what, what that direction is, but you're young and have time is in your favor. Go do it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>